Um, Matt Fraser, Robert Cheek, Josh Lajani, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks for Thank, having us on, guys. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so we're talking about your your runaway blockbuster bestseller new book, The Plant-Based Athlete. And I am admit I'm a little surprised that it's gone so mainstream. You know, there's so many plant-based books that everybody in the plant-based community buys, and we talk about it among ourselves, but this has kind of been a crossover thingy. So first of all, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate Thank that. You. Yeah. And we got Josh here. Um, actually, I had the idea of asking Josh to be part of the conversation before I knew he was in the book. <laughs> I was sort of like, like halfway through and I'm like, oh, you guys know Josh, I'd love for him to participate too. And then I'm like, oh, there's like seven pages of Josh. So I guess you do. Um, <laughs> which, absolutely. Which, which was a, a complete honor. It was a very surreal moment listening to the words he wrote about me because honestly, like I've, I just, you know, I never achieved my boss, my BQ like you did. And I, and, and I never got to Leadville like I wanted to after reading Scott Jurek's book. And so it's, I've always felt like I've been clawing and not really making it to it. But then you guys put me, me in such, wrote about me in such a way that made me feel achieved and accomplished and stuff. And I just, it's, I, it was greatly appreciated. And that's, I just want to be able to say that clearly to your face. Thank you. Oh, well, well, that's awesome. And, and well earned too, Josh. I mean, you have you have one of the most inspiring stories in the book. And we interviewed Olympic athletes, world champions, Guinness world record holders, professional athletes from many major sports, 60 athletes in total. And as I was writing these stories and compiling them and, and, you know, we, as Matt and I were both reviewing them and putting the book together in its final form, like your, your story stands out as something that I think a lot of people can really, really be inspired by. And, and I, so I just want to thank you for, uh, and you've, you've earned it. Like you, you really have, you've, you've earned it. You have done an incredible transformation. You, you, you kept going when most people would have given up, you achieved things that many long distance runners have never achieved, even though you started out as a football player. I, I mean, and you, you have a, a compassion about you, uh, for your family, for your friends, for your community. And I love that. I love the hometown. I love the the regional feel to your story too, that you, you care so much about, about, you know, where you're from and, and you have a lot of pride with that and, yeah. and what you're doing for that community and inspiring neighbors and friends and family. And I think it's just a wonderful story. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you. It's beautiful. I love both of you guys stories. You both have played a huge role in you on the muscle side, Robert, you know, because a big part of my life was wanting to always lose fat, and, but not lose muscle because I always identified as a big football player guy. So that was important to me, but also this new running thing. And I'll never forget, I was listening to Matt on his, uh, I, I don't know how many times you've been on Rich Roll now, but it was your very first, it was the very first time I'd ever heard of you. And y'all talked about running 50 Ks. And you talked about if what I learned was if you could just run an 830 pace, all day you might be able to win a 50k and it was like what <laughs> and i'll never forget that little nugget in that <laughs> interview and it and it and i just grabbed onto it you know and so thank both of you because you both have inspired me along the way as well it's not just rich and scott and all of the you know the people on the mount rushmore which i think you are guys in my mind on my inspiration mount Ru mount rushmore for sure and uh i just thank you it's just an honor to be here and we don't need to do this the whole time, <laughs> but it, it, we could. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with a, with a call. Yeah, and Howard offer. Jacobson is, you know, <laughs> let's not get started on him. I love you, bro. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious why you guys wrote the book. Like, what, what did you see in the movement, in your own lives, that was like, this is needed right now? Yeah, so that kind of happened in, in both of those ways, it was like the timing worked out and, and perhaps that, that kind of what combined to make it have the success it has. Like for Robert, we both were around at the kind of beginning of this, like, uh, I mean, he, he much longer than I, Robert became vegan in 19, what, 1995, I think. Um, me, I've been plant-based now for 12 years. Uh, but like, you know, 12 years ago for me, that's when Nomad Athletes started. And that's when Robert's, he'd, he'd been doing his bullet, or his uh, message boards for a little few years by then. So like, that was kind of, to me, the beginning of the, the internet and the and the the rest of the world starting to learn about plant based fitness, um, you know, when it got to be beyond just the very handful of rare cases here and there, 
Um, and so we were both here at the beginning of it. So we both did the natural thing, which was write books about our philosophy. Um, I had written a few, Robert had written four. Uh, and so had people we've mentioned already, Scott Jurek, Rich Roll, um, and, and about a dozen others had written by this point, by, by two and a half years ago, you know, a lot of people had started to write their stories. But as much as the movement had come and, and it had grown so much in those 10 years, like in, in, I don't know, 2019, 2020, compared to 2010, it was just drastically different, the amount of mainstream awareness. And, and these same people have, had, have, have been responsible for that. Um, but so like everyone had done that. And, and, but Game Changers, the movie had come out and like we were starting to see this mainstream appeal of this. Uh, but no one had yet written the book that was, that was about anything beyond their own particular approach to this. Um, you know, there were some things that existed, but, but none that had been done in, in the way that I think was, was marketed and meant for really a mainstream audience. Uh, and so that's what, when Robert came and pitched this idea to me, and I guess it was 2018, um, he said, like, this is like, let, let's write the book. Let's not, not just our approach, not, not one person's way of doing this and one person's story, but the one that's about like all the very top athletes in the world who are using this diet, many of them using it for performance reasons specifically, um, which, which to me is a big difference because so many of these stories had been motivated by people being ethically motivated, uh, like me and Robert, uh, and then, and then finding out that it works really well. But nowadays people are doing it specifically because of what it does for their performance. And that, that's a real difference in, I think the way it will be perceived by, by everyone else who's not ethically motivated perhaps yet. Um, so yeah, I think that's the big one. Robert, any, any other reason why this book has done what it has? Yeah, partly uh, what the, the expression I keep using Howard is that we wanted to tell the compelling stories of the world's greatest plant-based athletes. And when you think about, you, you asked, you, you were you said you were kind of surprised that this book perhaps, you know, hit a home run and, you know, landed on the New York Times bestseller list and became a number one international bestseller and publisher's weekly bestseller and, and translated into various languages and all this so quickly. Partly it's because we did have so much involvement from the community. I mean, we interviewed 60 different elite plant-based athletes and many of them, dozens of them helped promote the book. We also interviewed uh, dozens of, of world-renowned experts, everyone from Esselstyn and Campbell and Gregor and Brenda Davis and Dr. Clapper and Dr. Khan and all down the line. Uh, we had their support along the way. And because the athletes contributed, contributed the recipes to the book, uh, you know, their, their stamp was put on it as well. And so, you know, they naturally wanted to spread the word like, Hey, you know, I've got recipes in this book. I've got my story, you know, like Josh's story in this book. Uh, and, and it was one of those things that I think the community rallied behind much like they did with Seaspiracy recently, much like they did with the game changers with forks over knives, with what the health with cowspiracy. It's just, you know, those are mostly documentaries, but it's, you know, maybe it's more equivalent to uh, Dr. Greger's How Not to Die, where a book came along and everyone's like, wow, this is this is really cool. This is going to help a lot of people. It's going to save a lot of lives, human and non-human animal alike. And we want to get behind this. And so this is a literary format of one of those big projects that people just wanted to get behind because partly the, the, the movement is coming of age. You know, it's we are rising at this time where, uh, uh, I mean, look, no, Novak Djokovic just won Wimbledon again for like the sixth time, his 20th Grand Slam. You know, Lewis Hamilton just keeps winning. Um, you know, Messi, uh, who's m mostly plant-based, if not ex exclusively plant-based, you know, just, just won again. Uh, it, all these athletes uh, are, are some of the best in the world and who are absolutely shining. Uh, you know, I've heard that Mark Cavendish is, is plant-based. I need to get that totally confirmed, but I'm cheering for him in the Tour de France. I watch it every night uh, because he's crushing it. He's leading in points right now. It, this is not just me, Matt Frazier, Brendan Brazier, Rich Roll, Scott Jurek, Fiona Oaks, and Christine Vardaros anymore from the early 2000s. Like this is something that people can wrap their heads around and they say, you know what? This is possibly, this is the future. And I want to get behind this. And I think that's why the book did really, really well because we're just at a point right now in our movement where it is going mainstream and we've got the, the athletes like Venus and Serena Williams and Novak Djokovic um, and, you know, Cam Newton and others who are doing this at a really, really elite level and they're help, you know, they're helping spread that message too. Yeah. The world, the world is definitely becoming more plant curious and it's because the, 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 you know, I mean, the result speaks for themselves. I mean, you don't just become plant curious because you're curious about plants. You become plant curious because you have all of these skins on the wall for the protocol. 
And and so people were digging in and you really gave them something useful to grab a hold of and educate themselves. And I love how it wasn't like as much as all three and four of us are really vegan and really identify as that you gave credence to the idea of, hey, man, look, listen, relax on the black and whiteness of it all. Let's understand things on a, on a sliding scale. Let's understand that more plants are better. And if you don't believe it, here's the proof, but that's fine. If you can just set people on that trajectory, you've, you've saved the world in a lot of ways, you know, one person at a time, if they, if they listen. And that, that's why I think it's so popular is people are plant curious because of all of those names that you just mentioned and people are getting there. Wait, he's plant-based too? Well, what, let me see. What does that mean? You know? Yeah, totally. I think, I think that's exactly right. And I love, and we've, that's kind of become a theme of these interviews because we have gotten to do uh, many more that are reaching outside of the vegan space. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they all often like end up kind of boiling down to, eat more plants. Like we can all agree more plants are good. And, you know, no, no radio host disagrees with that statement. Uh, so like, I, I think you're right. I think the book has really tapped into that. And, and we, I don't know, I guess, I guess it was a conscious decision. Um, just as the book came about, like it became clear, like if we wanted to reach this audience, that would have to be the message. Uh, and so of course, you know, we, we do say like more plants are good and there appears to be no limit to it when that stops being true. So like, you should just keep eating more plants and you'll be better if you eat, if you go all the way than if you don't. But uh, if you can't even fathom that right now, like, that doesn't even need to be your goal. Just just start by eating more plants and, and see what happens. Because that's how I got to do it. I just started eating more plants, eating less meat, which I was ethically motivated, but I didn't plan to go vegan. I just wanted to become like eating just fish. And I did that. And then I was like, well, this feels great. I'll, I'll go further. So I think that idea of like, I just want to go to the next step and, and see what happens. I think that's really powerful. And I think that uh, appeals yeah. to a lot of people in the mainstream. Right. And it's so interesting that, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, it's really being... Um, couched in terms of performance rather than like here's okay you want to be you want to be vegan here's how not to have your athletic performance suffer right like yeah like when i started joining the movement there, there, i think there's still this kind of this this, this debate there's different like dietitians and some of them are like this is the best diet for your health and they're sort of you know channeling campbell gregor Esselstyn, barnard McDougal and that. And then you have a bunch of other dietitians who are saying it's not necessarily that much better than a clean diet right. that includes other things, but you, you need to pay special attention because there are things you're going to miss out on. And there's not a big difference between those two stances, except like dogmatically, like they became two camps that really kind of hate each other. And I love how you, you know, you you very elegantly skirted that whole argument. Um, You know, like, go ahead, Robert. And we really wanted to try to include people from both of those camps in the book too. You know, we have a quote from Jack Norris, who's more on the, uh, with Jenny Messina and and the other camp that, you know, maybe it may not be that much better uh, from a nutritional standpoint, but it's an, it's, they have this ethical imperative, you know, that that's on their side. Um, but, and then we have the, and we have Campbell and Esselstyn and, and others who are on the absolutely, this is, this is superior nutritionally. Uh, and, and there is some gray area there. Like Josh was saying, it's, it's, it's not just black and white. You can, you know, you, you can make an argument for a really, really healthy diet that includes some fish or something like that versus hundred percent plant-based. But then there's the, the different ethical, moral, moral arguments you can make um, or personal preferences or stances you can take. But what we wanted to do was to really include uh, a variety of different experts and uh, and di- uh, dietitians, nutritionists, uh, doctors, PhDs in this book, getting their input. And something I, I, w- I wanted to mention, Howard, I thought you'd appreciate. Uh, we also, I think more than perhaps any other uh, plant-based fitness book, it included more scientific studies and in this book. And partly th- we just have more to choose from. I mean, you, you no doubt have followed and and you know you co-authored a book with uh, Dr. Garth Davis, proteinaholic, and and Dr. Davis is posting. It seems like every week a new study uh, on a plant-based diet and the benefits, including some studies done on athletes and not just endurance athletes, like the Montreal study that came out in in April, I think February or April, but uh, but strength studies as well using uh, males, you know, age 19 to 34 who have goals of building muscle mass and strength and finding out that after eight or 12 weeks. The, the results 
uh, for plant those on a plant-based diet versus those uh, on an omnivorous diet are exactly the same. Like they're building the same amount of strength. They're, they're maintaining the same amount of muscle mass, but then we can talk about some of the long-term benefits of a diet that doesn't have the dietary cholesterol that has lower saturated fat that doesn't have class one or class two a carcinogens that does have high antioxidant content that is packed full of fiber that's loaded with phytonutrients and vitamins and minerals and water and and then you can you can see you know the the, the health and longevity benefits of one of those diets versus the other so i think that's another reason why the book is done well is because not just the names on the back of the book or those who endorsed it, but the fact that people are, are recognizing now they see it on, you know, their Yahoo news feed or their, you know, uh, social media or on television, then a new study comes out about a, the benefits of a plant-based diet. They just start hearing more about a plant-based diet and realizing that, well, they're, they're active, they're fit, they're, they're an athlete. Is this, can this be done? They look it up and they, they find out there, there's an entire book on this subject uh, that's brand new and that's doing well. And I think that also attracts people. Yeah, and, and one thing I love about this whole domain is that there is gray areas, there is debate. Like I'm reading some really smart people who are like, no, a plant-based diet isn't, this, there isn't the proof, there isn't like, like it's very complicated. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm not just talking about like, you know, the keto warriors, but people that I really regard as brilliant, well-read, ethically minded, like they're not trying to sell anything. They're not quacks in any, in any sense. And they're saying there's still a lot of gray area around this. And so what are, what are we gonna wait for? We, we've done all the epidemiology and epidemiology is extremely messy because there's so many other factors involved. We, we, we've done a few randomized control trials. There's more and more thanks to you know, Kevin Hall at the National Institutes of Health and that, but we're not gonna get the long-term randomized clinical trial of, of randomizing people to one diet or another, following them for 30 years and seeing what happens. But, and, you know, Josh and I were part of a company that tried to get a study going, a very, very minor, small, modest study. We couldn't do it. It was too hard from, from all sorts of perspectives. And what you guys are, are saying is it, with athletics, the proof is in what you do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like there is, a, there's a level of like, we don't have to talk about dogma. We don't have to talk about epidemiology. We don't have to talk about study design. Eat this way for six weeks, see what happens. And for, you know, for all of us, it was like, oh, I, you, know, you could show me whatever study you want, but my, my own N of one is more relevant than anything else. Yeah, and it also, it also the same applies to me, like to just to how you feel. Because I think it's like, you know, there are a lot of diets that work in the short term. Um, like a paleo diet is going to help you build muscle quickly if you really want. And if you do it kind of correctly and, and not, not the, well, even if you do it incorrectly, I guess you could, you could still build muscle in the short term doing a detriment to your long-term health, but, but whatever. Um, but yeah, I think, so I think like, that's kind of what we wanted to do was just show that like, this is, this is absolutely worthy of consideration when you're talking about short-term performance. If you don't have the patience to even think about long-term, which a lot of people, unfortunately, that's how they are, right? They're not going to think about ethics. They're not going to think about the environment. They're not even going to think about long-term health. It's how am I going to feel tomorrow when I start eating this way? Uh, I think, I think when you see top athletes doing this, um, that, that helps with that argument and helps you think like this might be the right short-term choice for me because it's going to make me feel better and look better next summer at the beach. Um, and so, you know, the other diets, I think for a while have, have had the advantage that like, they're going to be better. Um, it, it was at least thought that that was the way to do it. But I think, I think that's what one of the strange uh, benefits of, of highlighting top athletes and that they're choosing this diet for performance, even though many people are not striving to be a top athlete, um, it just sort of shortens the, the time frame, like during which this might appear to benefit you. And I think that's an important thing. I think that is something that kind of has been missing from plant-based, uh, you know, marketing, so to speak. Okay. So what, one of the dogmas that I accepted for a long time because I heard it from my, my, you know, vegan doctor heroes was just eat plants and don't worry about it. Right. And that's, that's sort of a little bit the message of whole, which I, you know, helped Colin Campbell write that. Right. It's so complicated. Biochemistry life is so complex that luckily all you have to do is just eat a diet of whole food plant-based and you'll be fine. And there was some debate maybe eight, 10 years ago about even is B12 included in that. And then, you know, a lot of the doctors, okay, well, we need B12, but there's, um, you guys recommend, you know, 
Like you're not like if the book was just eat whole plants and you'll be fine, that would have been an index card, not a book. Like there, there right. is some, there is some nuance, there is some complication, and there is some value in in dialing it in and and not just saying you know this message like oh everyone can do it. It's it's so simple. It's it's the natural thing. How did you guys approach that? You know that continuum of so it, just do it versus like measure a portion. Yeah. That's that's a great question, Howard. And I'll I'll let Matt go into the nuances in a moment. But I just first want to make a statement that, uh, in my opinion, Howard, perhaps ninety nine percent of people don't really know what they're actually eating. They 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 remember the things that they that were healthy and that made them feel good. They forget about all the microwave food, the the fast food, the processed food, the oily foods, the refined food, because we don't want to think about that. We feel bad about that. These moments of weakness, which by the way, happen every single day. There's moments of weakness when you're in the car, when you're impatient, when you're hungry, when you're at home, when it's late at night, when you're lazy, when you're tired, like we reach for things that are not. So even the idea, the, the idea of just eat you know, exclusively whole, people just don't do that you know, unless maybe you live in the Campbell household <laughs> or the Esselstyn household, um, you're just not doing that. And, and also I think 99% of people have no idea how many calories they expend per day and no idea how many calories they consume per day. This is the, the fundamental reason why there is a, you know, there's an, an issue with obesity in our country. Obviously it has to do with the processed foods and empty calories and, and, and very cheap calorie dense foods like sodas and candies and pastries and, and subsidized foods like fast foods. And we can, you know, obviously I know your book, you know, um, sick to fit goes into some of that stuff and, and all that maybe a separate topic, but I, but I just want to mention that right up front that I think most people are, are not truly aware of what they're eating. And as someone who competed as a bodybuilder for, for 10 years and had to document this stuff, I had incredible control over, uh, over my outcomes. I was able to put on, you know, I mean, I put on a hundred pounds. I'm like the opposite of Josh. I, I actually put on a hundred pounds during my entire journey from 120 pound uh, teenage vegan distance runner to a 220 pound champion vegan bodybuilder. But I put on, you know, 50 pounds in a short amount of time because I was eating a calorie surplus combined with weight training and all this kind of stuff. And then when I had to lose body fat to get ready for competition, I would drop 20 pounds in a short amount of time to get rid of the body fat and, and get rid of some of the water weight. And I just knew how to do that because I, I was aware of some of those things like calorie uh, you know, intake versus expenditure. What we're not suggesting is that you count every calorie, but what we're suggesting and recommending is that you at least take an inventory or audit your, your diet and training you know, for a week or so to get to know more about yourself. I've often said one of the most eye-opening things you can learn about yourself is what you actually eat in a week because it will surprise you. You will, you will, disturb, you will discover what you uh, are basically addicted to, um, some of the foods that you're not eating. You may have been plant-based for years, maybe even decades, but a, a salad doesn't come on your menu uh, for days in a row. Uh, these are things to be aware of. Or, wow, I didn't realize I eat so much white refined bread. I just, I just didn't realize that. Or that I have oil three, four times a day. And maybe it's not inherently bad, but the amount that I'm consuming leads to all these extra excess calories. And no wonder I'm having a hard time losing weight, those kind of things. So, so first of all, I think it's using something like the Harris Benedict calculator to determine what your calorie expenditure is, and then using chronometer or my fitness pal to document your calorie intake for a week will give you a, a bird's eye view of what you're actually doing, like what your behavior is. And then from there, Matt can talk about some of the specific nuances that, yeah, you do need to focus on certain vitamins and minerals and, and have these things complement, you know, a, a regular whole food diet if you are athletic minded. That kind of stuff right there is why this book is a home run, because that is beautiful. You nailed it. That's exact. That's the way to couch all of that very technical, the, the very technical component, is it, which, is the, which is daunting to a fat person trying to get into this, trying to move. But to be able to think about it in a way that you just explained it is beautiful, man. Just, um, it's a huge help. Thank you. From someone looking back at what I needed back then, and I had to kind of cobble it together on my own. You like you got it all laid out there beautifully. Thank it's you. And imagine brilliant. the control that you have when you know yes. that. When you know, like, ah, of course I'm not losing weight because I'm in a calorie surplus every day, and I'm eating empty calories and I'm drinking my calories 
No wonder it's not working. What if I just walk a little bit more? Or what if I just cut this food out? Or what if I, you know, stop eating the processed foods? Right. Owning the temporariness of it. I'm going to just check this out for a week. That's so less daunting than I'm going to have to do this for the rest of my life if I want right. to lose all of this weight. Right. No, it's about exactly what you said. Let's take inventory. Let's look. Let's be real. Like Elliot Kipchoge says, number one rule, do not lie to yourself. Yeah. And the way to not lie to yourself is actually record what's happening, record the data, you know, and it's beautiful. And we get a snapshot. We don't have to do it exactly. forever or commit to forever, but let's see how many Twix bars we eat in a day and actually calculate that against what we burn in a day. And let's get real. Let's talk about it in real terms instead of like wishy-washy terms. Right. Well, I eat a plant-based diet. I don't know what's wrong. Whoa, that's not nearly specific enough. You know? I think I think there are a couple things going on. Like one is that the doctors, a lot of the doctors, um, they they have a tremendous understanding of the theory, but they're often not as good at the practical applications of it. And Amen. I think I think it's an easy make the mistake to make to be a doctor, see from this high vantage point, and say, look, if you just eat whole foods and take some B twelve, you're going to be fine. And and fifty years from now, you're going to do as well as anyone else, and hopefully better uh, if you eat this way. But like you said, Howard, like that would be an index card of a book and that message wouldn't spread and almost nobody would actually do it because there's not enough there. I, I think it, it's not believable. It doesn't seem like something that you can do, especially when we've, we've, you know, had this, this reductionist view of nutrition all of our lives uh, to have something that radically different while that may actually work. Um, it, I, I don't think it's something that is, that is palatable, honestly, to, to a mainstream culture who thinks that it can't be that simple. Um, and it's not to say that this is all, you know, hand waving and kind of faking that, that you need to be this careful because a lot of the athletes in the book, there are a few of them who do eat, um, you know, in this sort of like more by feel way and they just eat whole foods and they eat what their body's craving. They don't really think about the numbers. There are a few like that. Um, but most of them, because, you know, high level sports, like there's, there's probably some more nuance that is required I mean, in terms of, you know, gaining or losing weight, uh, losing body fat. You know, there is more nuance that's required and that those are things you can control by by you know thinking more granularly than if is this a whole food or not and you can actually think you know what what nutrients is it composed of and what things is it going to give me so i think that's a big part of it um as for like the supplement specifically i i also think that a lot of people have this this idea that if they admit that a plant-based diet needs supplementation with it and that the more supplements you say are helpful for a plant-based diet, the more you are weakening the, the argument that a plant-based diet is a good one. Uh, and, and I don't really believe that at all. Um, because I, I think if you look at the, the science, like to me, if, if a plant-based diet with these handful of supplements is going to be better than the alternative and an omnivorous diet that doesn't have a lot of supplements, uh, I'll take the plant-based diet with supplements. Like I don't really care about whether it's supposedly more natural or not. Um, so like, I, and I guess to me, like if you look at these supplements that we recommend in the book, um, you know, there's of course B12, there's D3, DHA, EPA. These are the ones that, while B12 is sort of now, thankfully, the universal, almost universal one, these other ones are, are becoming more and more accepted by vegan doctors. And then you've got the other stuff that Dr. Furman's rec recommended for a while, the, the iodine, zinc, K2, um, <clears throat> selenium. You know, there's some things that you can get from food if you really try, but, but if you're not going to put that much effort, again, coming back to the practicality, if you're not going to put that much effort in, um, it, it pays to supplement with them. To me, the, the risk there, like there's not a great risk of, of supplementing with these things. Some of the, like, if you take too much D that, that could become a problem. Um, but most of these things, like the cost of, of supplementing when maybe you didn't need to, it's not a very high cost, right? There's the cost of actually doing it. And, but the health risk is, is minimal. Whereas to me, the risk of B, if you're one of say one of you know, the certain amount of people can't adequately convert ALA into DHA and EPA. So they should be take, taking the DHA EPA supplement, but you don't really know that unless you go get tested and figure it out. So if, if you're not going to go to that, uh, then there is a cost. If you choose not a supplement, there's, it's possible that 30 years down the road, your, your brain's not going to be in great shape because you didn't give it these omega-3 fatty acids. So like to me, if, if, if the cost of missing out on these supplements is kind of a big one potentially, and the cost of taking or the risk of taking them is, not very high, then I'm going to err on the side of taking the extra things, unless I'm married to the idea that by admitting that I take some supplements, I'm weakening the, the argument for a plant-based diet. And, and to me, I, I got past that a while ago. I don't really care about that part. Uh, I just want to do what I think is best for my health. So that's why we recommend more than just those things, or sorry, than just B12. 
Um, and I, I don't know. I, to me, I think that's why, again, coming back to why, why this thing has reached the mainstream success it has. Um, I think, I think people appreciate that rather than, than uh, to me, I think you sort of like people, I think do a disservice when they try to uphold this diet based on its completeness that we don't need to supplement. Um, I, I think, I think there's a risk of people trying, cause we run into a lot of people who try this diet and then 30 days later, they come and say, Hey, I tried being vegan, but it didn't work out. And often it's cause they didn't need enough calories. They, they replaced the, the meat and the cheese and they lost 30% of their calories overnight, but there's other stuff like the supplementation. And I think sometimes that's the reason, um, why people don't feel so good when they do it. So I think, I think the arguments, these wishful thinking that this diet is completely adequate without any supplementation. I think that actually ends up doing a disservice to, to this movement. Um, so that, that, that's why that's our approach. I, I, I heard, I heard Russell Brand, I'm sorry, Howie. I heard Russell Brand say something one time in an interview that said the deliberate removal of nuance is tyranny. And so uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like the absolutism that I, even I felt that even I was like sort of real idealistic about in my early days of becoming plant-based, the removal of the nuance that you were just talking about, it, it, it becomes like, like, like irrationally sort of tyrannical a little mm. bit. Right. And, and so every, and since I've heard that, that interview and hear that quote, I've been everywhere in my life where I'm looking at where we're removing the nuance so we can stay on this absolute path that feels tyrannical and not really where I want to be in my life. And so that, that's, that's all, that's all I wanted to <laughs> say is I think that I understand why we want to be so, you know, holy gospel about whole food plant-based but if we remove nuance from the conversation we become you know the optics are very tyrannical looking and it gives fodder to people like the joe rogans of the world that get to yeah but us to death and because we're trying to hold this absolute argument like it's truth and he can poke holes in it really really easy because we're denying all of the nuance that is there and so I, you, again just another reason why i think this this what y'all have done is really helping everyone catch a catch a handhold on actually understanding reality where it exists what we say when we're talking about plant-based ness plant-based diet you know all of that stuff and all of the nuance that goes into it because i'm myself starting to supplement more and you know pay attention to calories more and count and put my fitness pal and i went get a body fat scan yesterday so i can understand where i am a lot to do with you got y'all's book now i'm understanding more maybe i want to be on the 60 20 20 sort of a split with all of the running that I do all of that came from you know just from the recent reading of of a plant-based athlete yeah but I see that's that's what I love about again athletes is you can't be dogmatic or you you can't be dogmatic and win right unless you're very very lucky because you know like I think it's a dirty secret in the vegan even plant-based community though a lot of us feel like shit a lot of the time and we will never admit it because that is a betrayal of the animals, right? Like, right. oh, I'm great. But honestly, like I've, I've been tired for like seven years. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I feel you know, like clearly the, the zealotry of my early years. And then I became sort of a public figure in a, little, in a small way for a certain, you know, as a mouthpiece for Colin, yeah. for, for certain ideas. And that I could, you know, that I refused to question. So like, you know, so one of them was this idea, you know, no, I don't need to supplement. This is a perfect diet. Another um, is this idea of bioindividuality, which, which people use as a cudgel to say, well, no, some people need milk or, you know, you can be eat intuitively and we're all different and what's good for you. And we want to say, no, everybody should be vegan. Everybody should be plant-based. And you guys sort of, because I think from your athletic background and just because of the your sweet, nice guys, you, you have a very, I don't feel like any, any dogma, mm -hmm. any, any holding on to anything. And that's really important as you present to athletes who are like, just tell me what's going to make me better. Yeah. Howard, I think you made a couple really good points there. I want to touch on briefly, and also, Josh, I, I appreciate your comments on the nuances because I can tell you firsthand, I mean, interviewing so many athletes, 
that are the, some of the best in the world. It is the minutia. It is the nuanced things that make a, a difference. And and that's, I mean, even understanding simply the, the Harris-Benedict equation and your, your calorie intake versus expenditure thing can be absolutely life-changing for people who take it seriously and actually have a wake-up call and document what they're eating for a few days. What do you have to lose? You learn so much about yourself and you have control, the word that is so important if you want to have uh, you know, any kind of impact on your own outcome on how you feel. And speaking of how you feel, Howard, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I just you know, uh, came out, so to speak, um, a few weeks ago, uh, admitting that I, I have an anxiety disorder I've been hiding for about six years because I did not want to hurt the animals. Now I've been, because I've been vegan for 25 years, even though I was on a speaking tour for 15 years and doing all this stuff, traveling around the world and, and all this, it just came out of nowhere, but I didn't want people to equate it to a plant-based diet Mm -hmm. and, and thinking that would, that would harm, you know, this cause that I care about. And I, I, I kind of opened up about it a year ago on a podcast and sure enough, I went to Twitter and I was getting blasted. It was only by one person, but I was getting blasted. Look at this Robert, you know, this vegan bodybuilder guy who's, you know, clearly suffering deficiencies because he has anxiety. And I'm like, dang it. And so I didn't talk about it, but I was, I was struggling. In fact, doing these interviews was, has been the most difficult thing for me, Howard, because my anxiety affects my speaking and my breathing. And it's something, you know, Matt and I, have to have to deal with, you know, whether I'm in a, a good state to do an interview today or not. And I, I kept it a secret until a couple of weeks ago when I've just, you know, I, I basically had enough. I was struggling doing these interviews all day long. And I finally opened up about it on social media and found out that so many other people, including leaders in the vegan movement, authors, uh, you know, famous people, reached out and they're dealing with the same kind of thing. And of course, it's tons of non-vegans as well. It's not something that's diet specific. It's something that I, I even took a class recently on overcoming anxiety. I, I, I heard a statistic that something like 70% of Americans deal with it in some form or another. Yet it was something I was kind of ashamed of and hiding behind because I didn't want it to reflect poorly on diet, even though it may have nothing to do with diet. But but I think but I think that that intellectual honesty is important. And so we talked about, and this was one of Matt's inputs on the book uh, about, um, you know, plant-based versus paleo. Like, you know, can't we all just get along and find some common ground here? And it's hard to prove, like scientifically prove that one is better than the other. And we're not trying to say that we're better. We're trying to say that this is a viable option and you can give a plant-based diet a try and you can still be the best in the world like Scott Durek or win a gold medal like Megan Duhamel or, or just, you know, feel, feel better, feel fitter, uh, healthier, whatever. Um, but I think, but I think it's important that you mention that, um, uh, Howard. And, and one more thing, because I mentioned this in a recent podcast, which I'm not going to say who it was with, but she, you know, she mentioned off camera later on that much like you, Howard, she said, man, I, I just didn't want to admit all my, my health issues to my listeners because, you know, I have these different issues that I'm going, I'm dealing with. Um, but but one thing, not, not only Josh and how you both mentioned this um, absolute absolutist or absolutism, if that's even a word, with, yeah. you know, fall into absolutes. But also another word for me was perfectionism. Mm -hmm. I, when I was writing my book, Shred It, which was all about a whole food diet with fitness, I was super inspired by Dr. Campbell. And, I, you know, he really inspired that book and he endorsed it. And I felt that I had to be perfect at all times. And the stress of that, which who knows, maybe led to my anxiety, who knows? But the, the, the stress of that became such a burden that I, I couldn't even eat certain foods, certain plant-based foods, vegan foods that I wanted in, in public, you know, thinking I might be criticized until I was on this vegan cruise that I go on every year. And uh, Matt goes on often as well. And I saw you know, Dr. Campbell up there eating vegan pizza at midnight. And I have photos with Dr. Greger holding a plate with vegan pizza on it that he's been eating. And I realized, oh, my heroes in, 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 the, in the vegan and plant-based and nutrition world have some room for flexibility. They're not always as perfect as you know, the words that come out in their lectures or even in their books. And that was a wake-up call uh, for me to understand that there's, there's, there's room for diversity and for variety. And for, uh, you know, as long as it's, you know, ethically minded, of course, you know, plant-based 
and, and vegan, there, there's room for these things like, like pizza and ice cream and, and burgers. And for a while, I wasn't so sure that was the case because I was so focused on perfectionism. And I think that has to do with my, who knows, my upbringing, my athletic background, my, my, my dedication to you know, academics, all these other things. But I think it can play out in the vegan world too. Um, this, this idea of perfectionism, but then we, if it's all or nothing and we come up short, it, you know, we, we then we say, well, okay, I'm just going to give up now on the whole thing. So, right. and uh, then, so and then I'm then glad the, you brought that up. And, the, and the, there's also the real actual need of actually doing the thing to get the results, you know? And so there's like, that's more nuance to talk about. You kind of more idealistic and stringent in the beginning and you figure out the areas to relax and where you to really match your long-term goals, what you, what's sustainable. And I, I think we're always in a flux in that part of our lives like constantly pulling levers and messing with the equalizer board and getting exactly, you know, what we want, given, given where we are in history right now, where we are in our like historical sort of timeline right now. And um, that's very important to give, to give, to give room for all of those nuanced marginal little things that don't really matter a hill of beans in the long term it, it, it it's it's your uh like this this desire to stay absolutely pristine that's going to break your consistency eventually it's when you able to give a little and bend in the wind you're less likely to break um and i love also while i'm thinking about it i love what y'all said about about paleo because I've told people and I've told Howard I've told people over and over my very first step to becoming plant-based was going paleo and actually doing the thing because I remembered after reading you guys' book was oh that's when I gave up dairy that's when I stopped drinking milk yeah. was when I went paleo mm -hmm. and then the rest sort of came when we went clean and then I eventually gave up cheese and stuff I was still doing but I had stopped drinking milk and stuff like that when I went paleo so paleo was a great entry point for a lot of people and there's no real science out there that actually pits the two against each other yep to me I mean I feel like I feel like as if, if you let's say you start out paleo and you start to learn more about the power of plants and you start to say wait a minute this processed meat that I thought was actually good is really bad and I'm going to replace that with plants gradually. Like you move towards this thing that has some small amount of meat in your diet, no dairy. Uh, and then we're talking about a plant-based diet. Like if someone, if, if they can't handle this perfection or they have to have these indulgences or they just simply cannot give up their family tradition of whatever meat it is and they just have to have it, then that relaxed plant-based diet and this, this, I guess, evolved paleo diet, they become essentially the blue zones diet. They're, they're the same thing where there's lots and lots of plants, very little bit of meat. And I mean, I guess the blue zones eat some amount of dairy, but it's mostly in the form of like some certain cheeses and things like that, but it's, it's not a, a ton of milk. Um, yeah, to me, I don't know. There's, there's that, that common ground that, that they have. The actual proportionality, not just like, oh, Greece, <laughs> it's a Greek diet, tons of olives and olive oil and fish. Right. No, man, that's no, you're not, no, that's your idea of it. And that's the, uh, that's the issue is people's idea of what paleo is gets mm -hmm. started. Yeah, it, exactly. it becomes keto or plant or like carnivore almost. And I think Matt, that's the word you, Matt just hit the nail on the head there, uh, finding common ground, right? Mm -hmm. This is, that's why I think our book is resonating with people is because Howard said, we're not dogmatic about it. Even if, you know, even if in our hearts, we feel this, this ethical minded thing, that's not how you communicate the science of a plant-based diet with people in a way that it's palatable for them, that, that they're going to embrace it. It's got to be, you got to find some common ground. So we realize the paleo diet's popular. We realize that keto diet's popular. We realize that on the omnivorous diet's the most popular diet, you know, followed in, in the world right now. And, and so we, we, we meet people, you know, where they're at, we find some common ground. And, and like Matt said earlier, and like it's echoed in, in the blue zones and in all of our work and in, in your books and all of our work is that if you just add more plants to your plate, you know, put more plants on your plate, that is, that is the key. You're, you're never going to get to a point where you're like, dang, I wish I didn't have those vitamins and minerals and nitric oxide and antioxidant fiber, and inflammatory yeah. compounds and dang it, all that fiber. I'm uh, man. Well, okay. Maybe with too much fiber, you you know, you sit on the toilet. You're like, okay, I could maybe. Yeah. I, I need you, a break. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing. You're going to find some common ground with people when you come at an approach that it's not, I'm right and you're wrong. A anytime you tell someone they're wrong, you lost them in the conversation. Like the argument's over. You, you just can't do that. And that's, 
you know, that, that dates back to, you know, uh, how to win friends and influence people or, or any just kind of, you know, common understanding of, uh, you can't just go at people with, you know, I'm right and you're wrong, but here's some common ground. Here's things that we both believe. And here's, um, here's some ways that have worked, you know, anecdotally really, really well for me. And that's an important, that's an important point we want to make. You, you mentioned that Josh in the first minutes of this conversation, that these are, these are anecdotal experiences, but the fact is we, we and Howard echoed this too. It's like, yeah, but that's how, that's what relates to me. That's how I experience it. You can tell me all day that this, this practice or this thing, is this is really good for this, but this is how I feel. And the fact that we interviewed 60 different elite world-class, and I'm talking like Olympic medalists and world champion athletes who all basically said the same thing. They all basically said, my performance got better. My inflammation went down. My, imp my recovery was improved like this. I didn't have to force this out of people in the conversations. That was just part of the conversation. And so I think those anecdotes are important because as Dr. Greger said in the, in the forward for the book, it's, it's, you know, the science explains these results. You know, when you eat anti-inflammatory foods, you, you remove pro-inflammatory foods from your diet. When you get more nutrients per calorie as a nutritional return on investment from your diet, when you include more fiber and you cut back on the artery clogging plaque and, and the stuff that's going to damage blood flow and reduce blood flow, and you take in more nitric oxide to open up blood vessels and, and healthier blood flow and, and cell nutrition, these have benefits. And, and you can experience that firsthand, even if it is anecdotal, you, you can't, you can't say that, uh, you know, Scott Jurek has, results have suffered, you know, from a plant-based diet. They just, you know, he's been doing this for decades. And, and as Josh said, the results speak for themselves. So um, we recognize this stuff is first person story anecdotal, but it's, it's super inspiring. And, and it's what people have actually felt and achieved. And it has not slowed them down from being the, in many cases, the best in the world of what they do. I want to shift gears here because I'm really curious as a semi-professional interviewer about the experience of writing the book, of having these interviews with these amazing people. And I'm, cur I'm curious about like what made those people agree to say, yes, I'm going to take time to help you. What were, um, what was their motivation? Um, you know, were there people that were sort of harder to get to than others? Like what? What was, you know, because I mean, you guys are known, you're not sort of, you know, like famous, but you're not, I mean, I'm imagining that some of these athletes were inspired by you guys, right? Yeah, that, maybe you had no idea. It was like, oh yeah, I read No Meat Athlete and, you know, I read Shredded and like, like really, you know who I am? Because you're like, <laughs> yeah. like, what would tell, you know, what was that like? Yeah, so I'll let Robert speak to that mostly because he was the one who conducted the interviews and, and wrote up those stories. So um, he, he can speak better than I can, but what you said, Howard, like that, that was a really amazing part. How many people, uh, who are really, really good at their sports, like way, way better than I've ever been in any sport, uh, or anything like red nomad athlete in the early days. And, and I'm sure it was the same with, with vegan bodybuilding Robert's site. Uh, yeah. Like Sonia Looney who world championship ultra distance mountain biker. She told me she's like been a nomad athlete fan girl for years. And I was like, what? Like, like how? Like, I mean, I don't know. I got to do like my stuff with just recreational sports. Like, I, I don't know. So it, that is so neat to hear that it had that kind of impact on people. Like Rich Roll is a good example. Like Rich Roll back in the early days was reading No Meat Athlete and look, getting energy drink recipes and stuff. And I'm like, it just doesn't make sense to me that someone like that would use this thing that I'm writing. Really, because I, I guess because I write everything for everyone. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not everyone, but I try to make it for the person who's kind of getting started. Uh, but I guess this, I guess this topic in general is just sort of still new enough that for a lot of people uh, who are really good at their thing, they still feel like they're getting started and still learning, which is which is a great attitude. Um, but yeah, that that's a huge surprise. And then, uh, like you said, like some of the athletes we just couldn't get. Like we we had in mind some of the really top mainstream people uh, who we could barely get a small quote from or whatever. And, and the hope is, I think it, that the success of this book and hopefully we'll get a bunch of mainstream media and stuff um, that could lead to a follow up where where we can get some of these really bigger names that, that we couldn't get this first time around. Um, so yeah, certainly some harder to get than others. Those who we did get, I think many of them came because they knew us. And that's one of the cool things about this partnership that was so exciting to me when Robert pitched it uh, was that people know us as like the OGs in this, in this movement, whether that's it certainly is deserved for Robert. Uh, I don't think of myself that way because I came to it 10 years later than he did even. And, you know, Scott and Rich and these guys were doing their thing before I came along, but uh 
yeah, I think there's just, there's this sense among the community that like, we've both been at this working really hard, doing some great service uh, for so many years that, you know, they just want to help and they want to be part of it. And, and they also believe that it's a sound bet that like, we're going to follow through. We're going to do what we say. We're going to, this will become a book. Um, you know, so Robert, you can take it from there with more details. Yeah. And I just want to say, you know, as, as OGs, like you guys look really good for people in their eighties and nineties. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. I actually, I actually like to say that, I, you know, I've been vegan since the late 1900s, um, which just sounds so, so old, you know? Uh, yeah. So I've been doing this from the, back in the 1900s, but Howard, that's a great question. I don't think I've been asked that in the 50 to hundred interviews, you know, we've done over the last few months. Um, about what the interview process was like. And it was really interesting, actually, to be honest. And I'm glad you asked that because as you probably know, you know, you've seen me around and uh, I, I do things like the vegan cruise for 10 years in a row. I've put myself on a speaking tour for 15 years. Like I go out of my way to be around people and meet people in our movement. And so, I mean, I was there at the Game Changers world premiere, you know, with Chris Paul and with all these famous athletes in, in, in Hollywood. Uh, California. And, you know, I, I just, I, I took as many opportunities as I could to meet people in person uh, before the pandemic, because this is a book I've wanted to write for a long time. Like Matt said, I pitched it to him back in 2018, but I had been wanting to write this for years, even years before that. And so someone for me who played a massive role in this was Dotsie Bausch. So Dotsie is in the Game Changers. She's an Olympic silver medal winning track cyclist. She was doing some filming uh, with Luisa Hoyas, who's a, you know, Oscar winning, you know, a producer of, of the Cove and, or uh, yeah, pr a filmmaker for the Cove. And of course he was involved with the game changers and, and she was doing some filming with him uh, for all these plant-based Olympic athletes out in California. And she knew I was writing the book. She, in fact, she was the very first person I interviewed in person at her house. And she invited me to come to this event. Uh, so they, they were doing some filming. This is a year ago before these, you know, before the Olympics to make these TV commercials with plant-based uh, Olympic athletes. And so I showed up and, and, and sure enough, there were these Olympic athletes there like David Verberg, who won an Olympic gold medal in um, on the U.S. Uh, track and field team and, and sprinting. So one of the fastest people on the planet. And as soon as he walked in the door, he's like, dude, he's like, Robert Cheek, man, I have your book. And I was like, you, you're kidding me? The same thing like Matt said. I'm like, like, you know who I am? And then, and then here comes Derek Morgan from the Tennessee Titans walking on the corner. He's like, hey, what's up, man? He's like, I got your book at home. And I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> and, and, and Rich Roll was there. And, and, and George LaRock, who was a great NHL player, 13-year veteran in the NHL, was there. And, um, and Heather Mitz, a three-time Olympic gold medalist soccer player, was there. And Rebecca Sony, who, who uh, won six Olympic medals. And I interviewed all of these people. Rebecca has a quote in the book. I, I interviewed Heather. I interviewed uh, Dotsie and all these people. And, and that, and that was, that was amazing. That was, that was in person. And, uh, and then Rip Esselstyn was another great person to put me in touch with. He's the one that put me in touch with Sonia Looney. Uh, the one, the person Matt just mentioned, who's a world champion athlete. He told me about Darcy Gaither, who's the first and only woman to kayak the entire length of the Amazon river. Uh, and so I had some people like that who helped me, but it was, it was really my, you know, my, my 25 years in this movement, uh, knowing all these different plant-based athletes and reaching out to them uh, that, that helped to get these interviews going. And th there were some that we tried, like Alex Morgan, you know, couldn't reach or Novak Djokovic couldn't reach. Um, but you guys know, I'm like, you know, my, I, I hustle, you know, I mean, I went to LA uh, for the Game Changers premiere. Then I went back to LA to, to meet with, um, with Dotsie and, and her crew. And then I went back to LA multiple times to go to the Beyond Meat headquarters because I was trying to connect with Kyrie Irving and, and some of the Beyond Meat athletes. And I was uh, meeting with Ethan Brown's assistant and I was leaving messages there and I was visiting their office and, and all of this stuff to try to connect with athletes. And some, I just came up short. And then uh, this is something that's, that's, that's relevant and important. Uh, we, we really wanted to focus on diversity. I, I don't know if you, you recognize, we have just as many female athletes featured in the book as male athletes, and we have people of different races and different backgrounds. And so one of the obstacles I ran into uh, is that last year in the spring was when I was doing most of the interviews uh, via email, when, that was, uh, when, when COVID was going on. And you may remember something else that was going on. Um, uh, that was during the uh, George Floyd murder. And so there were a lot of athletes that I was trying to reach, but it was, it was a difficult time. 
to reach out to uh, to African American athletes who you know because one one even told me he said Robert this is not the time you know to be to be asking me to be I- interviewed for a book when I'm you know I'm taken to the streets and I'm doing stuff and I I had to be really really sensitive to that so there there were numerous athletes I wanted to develop bigger stories and include bigger features but it wasn't the appropriate time to be saying, you know, do this favor for me uh, or take this time to do this for me. And so some of those athletes, uh, we didn't get to develop those stories as well, like with David Verberg or, or Cam Awesome or a few others that I really would have liked to. Uh, so those are some of the, the the challenges and obstacles that were just inherent in this process. And, and then Howard, you know, as you know, I mean, there were lots of follow-up interviews and back and forth. And some people just were just hard to reach after a while. You know, and 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 so I couldn't develop as much of a story as I wanted to, and so uh, that that's largely how we determined the thirty or thirty-one athletes that had a nice big feature like Josh in the book. They were the ones that were the, 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 the I don't know the most willing to communicate and do three, four, or five follow-up interviews, so we could really tell a powerful story to have the impact that 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 it's having. And so, uh, like Matt said, I think. This book will no doubt uh, somehow reach you know, the Alex Morgans of the world or the Tom Brady's or these great NFL and NBA stars. And, and perhaps there's a, a follow up version of the book that can have some of these athletes who be like, hey, you know, I would have liked to have been in that. I just didn't know about it, you know, and they may reach out to us. And that's happened in projects in the past. And so we look forward to uh, connecting with some of those some of those superstars in the future and especially as so many athletes in soccer and tennis and basketball and, and Olympic sports are following a plant-based, athlete, a plant-based diet now, it seems fitting that um, in the future we'll, we'll be able to uh, get some of those bigger names we just couldn't quite reach on our own. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Well, I just want to let the record to show that Josh kept an admirably neutral face when you mentioned Tom Brady, so kudos. <laughs> oh, wow, but I'm on. <laughs> and I realize Tom is not 100% plant-based, but he's someone who really helps move the conversation because he's had this the longevity benefits of a very plant-centered and plant-forward diet, much like Serena Williams has. And I think that's important too, especially when you're reaching the mainstream audience, people who want to benefit from putting more plants on their plate if they're not ready to go all the way yet. Someone like Tom Brady opens that door and then they realize, oh, well, it's not just Tom, it's all these other people who are doing it 100% let me try doing it hundred percent and let's see how that works for me. Yeah. Cam Newton's vegan too now, by the way. So. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And he's a, quite a specimen. I, I know he doesn't have quite the numbers, but that man is just like Superman sometimes. Yeah. So, anyway. And former MVP. Yep. And, and I'll close with this, that, that for your, your comment that I love that it's that the title of the book is about an athlete because when we were talking earlier about like, it's so hard to, you know, to either be all or nothing or that like this whole slippery slope and I'm worried about it. My clients who are trying to lose weight or reverse disease, they almost always suffer with this slippery slope thing. Like they do good and then they, they drop the 20 pounds or they, they drop their diabetes meds. And now like, oh, well now I can have a little bit more. And they're constantly in this, in this, no man's land of confusion and questioning of what they should do. Whereas an athlete, you know, I, rem- I remember Matt meeting you and Raleigh at the, at the Fleet Feet store and you, you hadn't BQ'd yet. You were talking about mm. this is your goal to BQ. And like when, when we become athletes, we have a GPS that's moving us in a, re- in a positive direction as opposed to a sort of a maintenance direction. And, you know, what I would love for this book is for people to, to see themselves as athletes, because I think all, all of us here don't really think of ourselves as athletes, except that we became athletes. It's not like it was, it was you know, from knowing our, our stories, it wasn't like that was who we were. It wasn't, you know, we weren't ordained. We're just ordinary folks who decided to be, to take on an identity of athlete. And Matt, you claimed that before you'd done great in a race, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, which, is, which, is, which is awesome because that's like, I want everyone, you know, like human beings are amazing athletes. And, and this is kind of a way in. So I want, I want to kind of get your, your reaction to this, the idea that maybe the book, not just promoting plant-based, but also promoting humans or athletes. 
Yeah, I love that. Um, I wish it were on purpose, and I don't think it was quite that well thought out. But uh, I know, like, I've been fighting that I am not an athlete objection from people for the whole time I've done Nomi Athlete. Uh, because I didn't make it, it wasn't meant to be me. And, and if, and if it was me, I don't know if I would have had the courage to call myself athlete, maybe, but it meant I was trying to start a site that was for the no meat athlete who might find this interesting. Um, and all along the way, when we try to sell shirts at, at, uh, you know, the veg fest and things like that, everyone would say, well, I'm into the no me part, but I'm not, I'm not an athlete. So I can't wear this. I'm not, I'm not willing. I'm afraid to wear that. Uh, and, but then they, there's somebody who goes to the gym three times a week and runs on the off days but they don't consider themselves an athlete. But I think what you're saying, Howard, is actually really smart. And I'm going to use that in the future because this comes up in tons of these interviews. People ask us, they say, okay, but this is the play-based athlete. You're talking about all these elite athletes, but what about the person who, you know, is just, is just a weekend warrior or they're, they're not even active yet. They just are trying to stay fit. And then we always have to come up with some sort of defense almost like as to why this is also good for them and how we actually wrote it for that person. Um, but no doubt putting the, the calling it the plant-based athlete, that is that title was designed to be aspirational. The hope would be someone would see that. We knew most people don't consider themselves athletes, but they would see that on a book and say, that's exciting. Maybe if I read this book, then I'd be a little bit more like that. Um, and so that's absolutely what we want. But I, I actually really love what you said that this that maybe athleticism is and in fact is that it's more a mindset than uh, you know, any set of achievements. It, you don't have to have done anything. You just have to kind of have this thing where you're not in, you're not you're not in maintenance mode. You don't get somewhere and then you're there. You're like striving to get to some greater level of physical fitness or health or, or achievement. And that's really all that an athlete is. So I think, I think actually we can say that um, when we're asked this in the future, that that's, that that's almost everyone who, like anyone who's even considering this book or listening to an interview like this, they probably have that something about them that is attractive that says like, wow, like I, I, I would love to have that in my life, that kind of purpose and direction towards something. And I know when I, like, that's when I go through slumps, that's what I'm missing. That feeling of like, I have this certain thing that this is why I am existing this six month period, because I want to do this accomplishment. Um, so I love that. And I think, I think that's something we can, we can definitely use in the future. And, and also just to add to that quickly, there are people, including someone on this screen right now, who at times did not identify as an athlete, right? Josh didn't identify as an athlete for a while, you know, post football injury. And Dotsie Bausch did not identify as an athlete until she started cycling to help with her, you know, uh, with, with some of her eating disorders and some of her, you know, um, drug addiction and, and overcoming that kind of stuff. And it's this idea that Rich Roll talks about, John Joseph talks about, Sonia Looney talks about, and Matt and I have been talking about of just showing up day after day. If you can just show up, all of a sudden you become an athlete. Like, I like that, Josh. You said, you know, no one ordained us as athletes. Like, I can't remember a time when someone said, oh, this is Robert the athlete. I just showed up you know, as a kid and I just showed up and I loved to play and I love sports. And all of a sudden I became a pretty good athlete and was able to compete at the collegiate level. And then I, I discovered this weightlifting that I had no business doing, but I enjoyed it. And I showed up day after day after day and became a champion bodybuilder in a sport I had no business being in from being a very, very thin long distance runner. But this idea that you can identify and you don't, and it's like what Matt says, now like you, you, you can, you can pick yourself. You don't have to be, you don't have to wait for someone to say that you're an athlete. You can say, you know what? I pick myself. I choose myself. I'm an athlete today and I'm going to show up day after day after day. And, and I'm going to do the, the activity that I enjoy, uh, regardless of what that is, regardless of how cool or uncool the sport is, I'm going to do it for my own reasons. I'm going to do it for my own mental health. I'm going to do it for my enjoyment and very likely very, very likely along the way, you're going to inspire other people just like Josh has, just like Matt has, and just like the athletes in our book have. And I think that's one of the, the great closing moments uh, and, uh, and, and lasting impressions we want to leave, Howard, is, is just show up every day and you can identify however you want to as an athlete. But the more that you show up, the more you pick yourself and the more you choose yourself. And you don't have to wait for anyone else to tell you you're an athlete because you're doing it, you're living it and you embody it every day. Yeah, no, yeah. nobody has to tell you. And, uh, and pointing out the proof sometimes helps people. I deal with a lot of morbidly obese people reaching out to me who, and so they, they don't like, they're very hesitant to think about themselves as an athlete until X. Right. 
Whereas what, when you point out the proof to them, how they're out athleting people around them every day right now, you wait, think of that skinny guy who's faster than you. Now put 200 pounds on him. How fast is he? You're going to crush him all day, every day. He can't get on a bus and get off a bus and go grocery shopping and get in and out of the car with 200 extra pounds on him. So your athlete is today and let's start flexing him. Let's just recommission that passion to like, oh, you know what? Maybe he's, maybe I am an athlete today. I don't have to lose all of this weight first. And I love the word athlete. I think we're default athletes as animals. It's what's driven our, our evolution over eons. And, and so the sooner that we can accept that, the sooner we can become our most authentic human version of ourselves. And um, that's, that's just my take. Beautiful. Yeah, I love that. And, and this, is a big, this is bigger than being an athlete. It's bigger than being able to throw far, run fast. When you know, Robert, we used to like showing up, like that's what we're asking people to do in the world. Like, yeah. there's, you know, everything's on fire right now. We need people to show up day after day and not, you know, oh, I'm going to be an activist for a week, but oh, it's too terrible. I give up or I, I can't stand the cruelty and the suffering. I'm just going to go back inside. Like the physicality of chasing athletics. I think that, I mean, there's, there's research on this, but just intuitively makes us stronger as human beings. If you want to show up for animals, if you want to show up for, for social and racial justice, if you want to show up for environmental healing, if you want to show up for love, then you've got to, you know, you've got to train your tool, your physical body, which is the thing that's going to be showing up. And I just, you know, I really want to honor you guys for having put it in such a powerful and accessible volume. Well, thank you so cool. much. Really okay. appreciate that. And, and thanks for the, uh, the platform and the opportunity to talk uh, with both of you today and, and, and what a pleasure it's been. And, uh, and thank you so much for your authentic feedback about the book too. You know, I mean, we worked hard two and a half years to put this thing together, interviewed a hundred different people, athletes and experts and, and, you know, spent a year revising it and just making it the best resource we could because we wanted it to be that standalone book. We wanted it to be the how-to book. This is the book, you want to be a plant-based athlete? This is the book you go to. So the fact that that actually resonated with both of you, who we hold in very high esteem and, and, uh, and, and take your words very, very seriously, that, that, that really means a lot. So, so thank you so much. Where can people follow you? Uh, so the book, of course, is is just about anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Books A Million, Bookshop, IndieBound, I mean, your local independent store probably has it, but you might want to call to make sure. Um, yeah, so we're, we're on we're on Instagram, uh, nomadathlete underscore official is, is our brand account, and mine is real Matt Frazier. Uh, Robert, you've got a couple Instagrams as well, right? Yeah, I'm mostly on Instagram these days at, at vegan bodybuilding and fitness or at robert.cheek. And of course, I run veganbodybuilding.com and Matt runs nomeatathlete.com. We brought the, the, the strength community and the endurance community together uh, for this book. And I think it was, it was a really beautiful partnership. And that's what we've seen so far. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for the work you've done for decades, your OG work, your latest work, for taking the time today. Thank you, Josh, for, for jumping on. And Thanks yeah, for having me. It's an absolute thank honor, guys, really. It's just thank like you. a pinnacle moment. Love it. Us too. So, all right. See you guys around. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Bye.